The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. Someone else is responsible for me. So I have everything I need. I don't have to strive, compete, struggle, retaliate. The shepherd is responsible for me. In the middle of that popular psalm, there is a peculiar image that goes like this. He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Isn't that a strange place for a table? In the presence of one's enemies. Well, to start with, food in the early uh, times was scarce. And so one did not waste food on someone who wasn't your closest friend. So whenever you invited people over to your house and there were no restaurants back then, how did they do it? You only invited people that you were familiar with, people that you knew and those that you liked. And so whenever you looked around someone's table, you could tell who their friends were. This was their preferred company. This is why Jesus was accused of eating with sinners and tax collectors because he was saying a powerful social statement. He was saying, in effect, this is my preferred company. And the enemies, in the psalmist's words, are not those who just attack you. The word means to press hard upon, to squeeze. It means to vex, to harass, to treat with contempt. And so an enemy to the psalmist was anyone who annoyed you, hurt you, threatened you, betrayed you, opposed you, undermined you, or drained you. You have prepared a table for me in the presence of people who annoy me, hurt me, threaten me, oppose me, and drain me. <laughs> if that doesn't shock you, Ask yourself, when you gather for the Super Bowl tonight, will they be in the room? That's not who you invite over, is it? So the question is, if God is preparing a table in the presence of these people, who's serving who? So one of the ideas is that God is serving us in the presence of our enemies. One popular preacher said, he sets before us row upon row of heavenly foods to taste and eat, and there is only one guest at the meal, you. Then, as you dine on these sumptuous foods, God anoints your head with oil. Meanwhile, he makes your enemies sit on the fringe and watch everything unfold. They see the Lord spreading your food, then they watch as you fill up your soul with heaven's delightful fare. Your enemies are in shock. They were sure God was going to strike you down, but now they've been ordered to watch as you feast on food served by God himself. What an incredible scene. Can you picture it? No, I can't. Jesus said, love your enemies. If you want to know who's serving who, follow him around at almost every meal he's at, and there's one of them there. There's a tax collector, 
a sinful woman, Zacchaeus, the Last Supper itself is one who betrays him. Almost every meal he's at, he's at a meal <laughs> with someone who annoys him, hurts him, threatens him, opposes him, or drains him. And he is never the one being served. He's always the one serving. This is harder today than it was before because I think you have more enemies today than you did before. In the last year, we've seen our relationships strained because of social distance. COVID has become an excuse to hang around with people you really want to be with and to avoid people you don't want to be with. It has reduced most of our conversations to technology, social media platforms. And then, right when all of that was happening, there was a series of flashpoints. These were sudden disruptive events that polarized the nation in different sides. And because we were already socially distanced, we could only have these conversations on social media. And social media is not sophisticated enough of a medium to have delicate conversations like that. Neil Postman likens it to Native Americans using smoke signals to talk about the meaning of life. You can't talk about the meaning of life through smoke signals. The medium is too simplistic of a platform. You need a more complicated platform to talk about delicate issues, but we haven't been able to do that. And so separated now by COVID, choosing only those that we want to talk to being forced to carry on delicate conversations through an inferior medium, technology has thrown us into circles of like minds. The algorithms have picked up our posts and surrounded us with people who are exactly like us. So the Brookings Institute said that for people on Facebook are more likely to be in contact with five people of like mind for every one person of a different mind. The University of Georgia has proven that those who use Twitter are far less likely to be exposed to people of cross ideological ideas. And so we were forced to communicate through technology about sensitive subjects and technology has thrown us into silos and insulated us from people of different opinions. Now here is the really good news. In about three to six months, after y'all have had your vaccines, you get to go back to work with these people you've gotten to avoid. I think that's why some of us don't want the vaccine. <laughs> Sorry. COVID, COVID. Suddenly you're gonna be working with people who posted something a month ago and you thought, I never knew that. I didn't know those were your convictions. I'm not sure we can be friends. So there's more of them than there was a year ago. And Jesus is saying, invite them to your Super Bowl party and serve them while they're there. Who are the people that are hardest for you to like? Who are they? 
I was reading through the Gospels a, a, a couple months ago, and all of a sudden, you guys, a whole cast of characters presented themselves to Jesus that I never noticed before. They were always there, and now I find myself wondering, how did he deal with these people? There were the Pharisees. They're the critics, and you can't impress them. They were the needy, they're takers, and you can't avoid them. They're the priests, they're leaders, and you can't follow them. They're disciples, they're followers, and you can't lead them. They're the government, they're skeptics, and you can't convince them. They're Pilate and Peter. They're allies, and you can't trust them. Every one of us have people like this in our lives. Most of us, at least, have people like this in our lives. Take a moment and give them a name. Not out loud. Really, they might be a couple seats over. But give them a name. Who is it? Wait a minute, Tom Brady. Mm. Mm. Donald Trump. Kamala Harris. Who is it? Name them. Most of us have only two responses, but almost none of us have a strategy for dealing with these people. Either A, we avoid them, or B, we overpower them. We avoid them when we, we don't engage with them. We defriend them. We triangulate against them. We talk to people about them, but we don't talk to them. We schedule our breaks, our routines away from them. Or we overpower them. We shout. We label. We play movies in our minds where we're having an argument with this person and we always win. We rally allies against them. We make it difficult for them to do their work because they disagree with us. This is our response. We either avoid them or we overpower them. But we do not have a strategy for dealing with them. And this is why that matters. Because Jesus said, this is the stock and trade of being a child of God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 7, Six, that when you forgive your enemies, people that annoy you, hurt you, betray you, threaten you, and drain you, when you love your enemies, you become sons and daughters of your Father who is in heaven. He does not say, if you pray the sinner's prayer, you become a son or a daughter. He says, this is established by semblance when you act like your father, when you act like your father, you prove that you are a son or a daughter of God. So if I'm hearing this right, there are more people like this in our lives and we don't have a strategy for dealing with them. And yet these people are the core of what it means to be a Christian. <sighs> Jesus said, love them. Twice. Verse 27, verse 35. Love them. And might I point out 
that love in this passage is not a feeling of fondness. To love them does not mean that you suddenly like them. It doesn't mean that you trust them. It doesn't mean that you keep putting things in their hands so they can take advantage of you. It means you treat them differently than they're treating you. And he goes through a series of these things. And there are external signs of this, and there are internal signs of this. The external signs is that when somebody hates you, you do good to them. When they curse you, you bless them. When they mistreat you, you pray for them. When they steal from you, you surrender it. And when they beg, you give it. The internal signs are even harder. Beginning in verse 37, don't condemn them. Don't judge them. Don't play videos in your minds where you overpower them. It occurs to me that Many of us are better at the external signs than the internal. We have the capacity to be courteous and kind to our enemies while all the while having private conversations inside. And watch what Jesus says. The problem with those private conversations that you've been having with yourself is not only that they damage the relationship they do, it's that they also damage your personality. Jesus says, if you judge, you will be judged. And if you condemn another person, well, then you will be condemned. So he makes it clear that the most critical people in the room right now are also the most paranoid. The ones in the room who judge people the most are the same ones who can't live with their own imperfections. The frustration that we vent on others turns around and comes back to roost. Are you tracking? This, this is an outrageous thing for Jesus to say. Love your enemies. Respond in a different kind. Edwin Friedman was an ordained rabbi and then a family therapist, and he studied families in crisis. And he said in his words, after studying thousands of families, he discovered that the one ingredient that determined whether a family stayed together or whether it disintegrated was what he called a well-differentiated leader. And what he means by that is someone who has the ability to live in the middle of the chaos without being overtaken by the chaos. It is someone who is close enough to the person throwing insults that they can still stay engaged with them, and yet they're not dependent upon them. They have their own values and their own vision of a beautiful life, and yet they wake up every morning in the midst of chaos, but they are ordered by what is inside of them and not by what is happening around them. I think this is something like what Jesus is saying. Even though they hate you and they curse you and they mistreat you, 
and they steal from you, and they slap you, you are motivated by what is in you, not by what is happening to you. And so you do good to them. You pray for them. You turn the cheek, and you give to them because you have a different core. So what's at the core? It's what I've been asking myself. I see two things in Jesus' words. I'll be quick about them. One is that we remember when our enemies start heaping it on that we have a different father. And that's not the way our father is. Our behavior is determined by our Father. It is not determined by the other person. This is why Jesus says, be merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. When you are merciful, you're like your Father. I think what he's saying is, how you treat your enemies reveals what kind of God you think exists. Maybe your God is a judge, and so everything for you is about justice. But if your God is a father, then he, he's not only just, he's generous. He doesn't only give people what they deserve, he gives them what they don't deserve because that's his nature. And so one of the things to remember, one of the things that orients us in the midst of this chaos is that the God who loves us is a different kind of God. And this is the one that we're Im imitating. Are you, are you still there? There's one more. The second thing that Jesus says that orients us is that um, we remember when our enemies insult us, um, our own weaknesses. In verses uh, 39, 40, and 41, he talks about judging people who have a speck in their eye when we might have a beam in our eye. Um, uh, psychologists talk about, well, at least some of them, the ones that use big words, um, talk about uh, um, motivational asymmetry. There, that's my big word for the day. Here's what it means. We tend to assume that our motives are usually pure and the motives of our opponent are usually corrupt. So, so when we encounter somebody who feels strongly in another direction, the reason we think we're right is because we feel motivated by justice and benevolence but we know that they are motivated by malice and greed. And we just assign these. Of course, he's talking about other people, not us. So Jesus said, remember, remember, when you go to judge someone else's arguments, judge your own. Before you are critical of another person, critique yourself. Psalm 23 is a powerful antidote for treating enemies. Because the Lord is my shepherd, because someone else is responsible for me, my well-being, I don't have to clamor 
or strive or compete or overpower my enemy. I can serve them. Because the Lord is my shepherd and because I lack nothing, I can willingly agree to be taken advantage of. And therefore, I cannot be manipulated. I don't just serve. I'm a servant. When you serve, you determine who and how far. But when you're a servant, it's everybody. They can't beat you. You've already given yourself up. 